Oh, good morning, church. Jesus is holy. Holy is the Lamb. O gracious God and Heavenly Father. Hmm. Lord, we elevate the name of Jesus this morning. We lift the name of Jesus to the place of all honor, to the place where he and he alone belongs. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy is the Lamb. Righteous is the Lamb of God. Holy is Jesus. So gracious God, as we, as we come before you uh, this morning to give you our hearts as an offering to you, not because we desire or expect anything in return, just because righteous is the Lamb. Holy is the Lamb. Holy is Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us today. Oh, may we hear your voice. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, please open your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 11, and we are going to be starting at uh, verse 19 and going to verse 26. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believe and turn to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first, at Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. As as I was pondering this week as I'm as I meant to do, I was pondering the, the content of this week's message and I'd been I'd been thinking about what is it that has been having such an impact on so many of us? Uh, over the over the last while what is it that as we have gone through acts that has been resonating in the hearts of so many of us and I think the answer is this it's the cross it's the cross right because Here's the thing, whenever God's people get back to the core of Christianity, it has an impact on everyone who's engaged in it. Right? Whenever the church gets back to the core of the Christian message, which is the cross, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sins and raised on the third day, it has an impact in our lives. It has an impact on all of those who are willing to allow it deep into their system. All right, it, it, it's been an interesting journey since Pentecost Sunday, hasn't it? That's when we really earnestly started in and, and started going through the book of Acts. And I think it's interesting where God has been bringing us. Right? The, the truth, if we're, if we're honest, we started in Acts to get 
a better understanding of what the true authentic church is meant to look like in hopes of then somehow being able to uh, replicate it or emulate it. And I'll be honest, I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking. You know, let's see what this church looks like and then maybe we can do something similar. Right? And, you know, the, often our thought is, is if a, if a vivid enough picture can be painted and a strong enough case be made for it, uh, then maybe we will want to be like it or be, uh, to be it. Right? I mean, if we think about it, this is how we do things in our culture. We find a model of something that we think is working and then we try and copy it. Right, and then usually somebody writes a book about it, <laughs> and so that others then can be just like us. But as I was thinking about it and pondering it, I realized that that is such a load. That's such a load. That's that's not how it works, because the church isn't like some sort of a, a club that can simply be replicated all over the place. Because the truth of the matter is, there is nothing simple about the church. There's nothing simple about what Jesus is doing in and through all of our lives. Right? And that, the, the reason for that is that the church is now, as it always has been, <laughs> the living, breathing Jesus Christ who came to redeem souls. That, that, that's not simple. And we can't simplify it. We can't find a model and then be it. We can't emulate it. Because the church is the living, breathing Jesus Christ who came to redeem souls. And I think that's what we don't get. Right? I, I, I think for many of us, I think we see the church as some sort of a, a community social where we can pop in and pop out when we don't have something more important to do. When we're not working at our real job or we're not on vacation or we aren't engaged in something else that takes priority. Right? We, we say to ourselves, Jesus will always be there. That's what we say. After all, when I'm, when I'm at home or when I'm by myself, I read my Bible and I say a few prayers and I ask God to fix my life. I maybe ask him to fix somebody else's life. I ask him to cure all the ills that I have. Right? So somehow I must be a real Christian. French philosopher Voltaire who was famous for his criticism of Christianity, was, was asked on his deathbed whether or, not, or excuse me, whether or not he was worried that if there's a God, that he would be condemned. And Voltaire's reply was, well, if there is a God, then, then he, meaning Voltaire, would be forgiven because that's God's job. Right? I think that's how many people see God, and that's how... We treat God, and, and, and in the church, that's how we treat God. Oh, well, if there is a God, he'll, he'll, he'll forgive me because that's his job. Somehow, that if there is a God, he's there to be used. Right? And it doesn't matter whether I'm completely committed or not. It really doesn't matter... Uh, how in, in unified I am with the body of Christ, it doesn't matter because I'll be forgiven. Because after all, that's God's job. He's simply there to forgive me. You know, it, it's interesting because if somebody treated us that way, right, we wouldn't like it very much. If somebody were at us that way, took us for granted that way. We wouldn't much like it, but somehow it's okay to treat God that way. Right? And, and we forget that over and over and over again in the pages of Scripture, God reminds us, do not pit my love against my holiness. 
Because you won't like the results. Do not ever pit my love against my holiness. It's a pretty sobering thought. In Matthew 12, when Jesus says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather uh, with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. That's a sobering thought. And what Jesus is saying here is that it's possible for people to find themselves outside of God's forgiveness. Right? All, he's saying that all external sins are forgivable. But what isn't forgivable is the internal resistance of the pull of the Holy Spirit on our lives. To be in a deep and abiding relationship with the one who made us. Right? All sins are forgivable, but what's not forgivable and, what, and where we find ourselves outside of the forgiveness of God is when we resist the pull of the Holy Spirit to be in a deep abiding relationship. And what's interesting, when, he was, when Jesus said these words, he was talking to Pharisees. He was talking to the church. He's talking to people who think, thought they had it all figured out. The more we resist the Holy Spirit pulling us into a deeper, more personal, more intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the greater list, the, the risk of standing outside of God's ability to forgive. That's what that text means. All right, so I, I come back to the question about what is it that's been having such an impact on us? Right, if it's not this picture of the church... It must be something else. It must be the cross. Only the cross of Jesus Christ can change everything for the church. Friends, you can't talk about the birth of the church and the church growing without understanding. Without us understanding this, that the point of the church is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the point of the church. The cross of Jesus Christ. The point is Jesus' death and resurrection. The point, my friends, is the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. The moment the church is about anything else, it ceases being the church. And I, I think, to be honest, the reason... Um, that some of us have been really impacted by this is because for years we haven't really been the church. Because we haven't been about the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. We've been about a lot of good things. We've been about building community. But we haven't been about building community under the blood of Jesus. We have been about Jesus as teacher. But we haven't been about Jesus as savior through his blood. We have been about Jesus as example. But we haven't been about Jesus as redeemer by his blood. In other words, we haven't been about the cross. And, and I, I don't know about you guys. Well, I do, but I know that this has really been attacking my heart. It's really been, it's been assaulting my soul. And it's been convicting me. And I think the place we get off track is that when, when we talk in terms of life and death, right? When we talk in terms of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we end up mostly concentrating on the life. And when we do that, Jesus simply becomes more of an example and a fixer than he is a savior and a Lord. Right? That's often how we pray. Jesus fix. 
Jesus, fix this. Jesus, change my circumstance. Jesus, do this. Jesus, do that. And it's not that he doesn't covet our prayers. That's not what I'm saying. But when that's the way we pray most of the time, Jesus is just a fixer. He's, he's, he's there to do stuff for us. He's like a genie in a bottle. He ceases to become our Lord. He ceases to become our Savior. When, when our emphasis in the church is on Jesus' life, the church resembles more of social services instead of an eternal kingdom. The church, my friends, is meant to be the eternal kingdom of God on earth. That's who we are. I'm not saying, friends, that Jesus' life isn't important. Because it, it clearly is. But when we separate it from the death and resurrection, we have forgotten the cross and the blood. And without the cross and the blood of Jesus, there is no forgiveness, there is no repentance, there is no baptism in Christ. And without that, Lord, without that, friends, there is no spirit. Which means that there is no power in the church. Without the Holy Spirit of God, there is no power in the church. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, without the cross, there is no spirit. And without the spirit, there is no power. And we have seen this, friends, for years. We've seen it for years. And it's, and it's humbling to say and it's sobering to think about. But that's what we have seen in this church for years. No power. Because we haven't been about the cross. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, an English pastor, said this, revival above everything else is a glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. <clears throat> it is the restoration of him to the center of the life of the church. Revival above everything else is a glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is the restoration of him to the center of the life of the church. Did you hear that? Revival is the, is the glorification. Not, listen, it is not the glorification of Jesus. It is the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the glorification of Jesus as our buddy. It's not the glorification of buddy Jesus. It's not the glorification of brother Jesus. It's not the give me stuff Jesus. It's not the glorification of fix my life Jesus. It's not the glorification of slot machine bless me Jesus. Not of any other Jesus but the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you and for me. It wasn't buddy Jesus. It wasn't brother Jesus. It wasn't fix my life Jesus. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, what, what, you're saying, okay, I hear you. You're yelling. What does this have to do with today's scripture? Well, it has everything to do with it. Because what I want us to see today is that today's text help us understand, understand why it is so important and that it is critical that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today's text is about discipleship. So the message is about discipleship. And so there's three things that we're going to look at this morning that we take out uh, away from this text about discipleship. And the first one is, what is discipleship? Two, how do we do discipleship and why? Which is the most important one. Why do we do discipleship? What, how, and why? That's going to guide our, 
our, our, our thinking today. What's going on here? Let's look at the big picture. The church is continuing to grow and to move. It's continuing to expand. It's continuing to spread out. And, and we need to see something here that the church moves to places that God desires it to move. Right? The church exists where God desires it to exist, which obviously is everywhere. Right? But text says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, uh, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. Right? The church was moving in the direction that God desired it to move. Right? Stephen was killed. Vengeance, right, by the Jews, killed Stephen. And the church scatters. God moves the church, the center of the church, out of its comfort zone. Right? To, to begin its mission to reach the entire world. But as human beings, friends, we have limited capacities. We think we're all that, but we're not. We have very limited capacities we never we, we, we think we do but we have a hard time seeing the bigger picture right the, the church in the beginning they thought the message was still just for the Jews now it's understandable we talked about it last week in all these cities that the, the church is spreading out to there's fairly sizable Jewish populations there so naturally, human beings that we are with limited capacities think, oh, well, the message is just for people like us. But then the text says that some of them went to Antioch and spoke to the Greeks, telling them the good news of the Lord Jesus. Right? And, and this has important implications for the church as a whole. For starters, what we see here is, unlike every other religion, there is no central seat of power for the Christian church. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the whole history of Christianity, the center of it, for lack of a better word, because there is no true center, there's no one place that says this is, this is the center of Christianity, but I don't have a better word. If we look through history, the center of Christianity, it keeps moving, right? As we go through Acts, we're seeing the center move from Jerusalem and, it, and it's going into the Mediterranean world, right? Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria, right? And we see the, the, the core of Christianity moving from Jerusalem now to the Mediterranean world. And it's going to end up for a few centuries in Rome, right? And that's where it'll reside. It'll reside in the Greco-Roman world there. And then... God uses circumstance of life. He uses the Reformation. And he moves the center of Christianity. It becomes a more Western European, North American movement center. And now we are seeing again, friends, we are seeing again another movement of the center. And, I, and please, use, I use the word center loosely. Okay, don't say, well, there's like a center, there's one place. That's not, that's not what I mean. But what we are seeing is that the, the, there's a shift now to a more southern hemisphere center, to Latin America, to Asia, and to Africa, as the, the place that is having a massive, the gospel is having a massive impact on. Right? There's no other religion like that. If you look at every other major religion, they, they have a center, an area, a region that it started and it hasn't moved from. Right? You have Judaism in Israel, Islam, Mecca, Buddhism in the Far East. Right, But that's not how Christianity works. That's not what God's doing. And the reason for that is because Christianity 
Because Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the way and the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through him. When Christianity, it's interesting, you know, when Christianity becomes the main influencer in area for too long, in any one area, uh, for too long, it becomes something that it was actually never intended to be. It becomes like every other religion. It becomes moralistic instead of transformative. It becomes, like every other religion, a, a pursuit of creating a righteousness of our own and then giving it to God and say, look, here I am. Look at the good things that I have done. Now let me in. Whenever Christianity stays, it becomes the main influencer uh, in a culture, in a society, this is what happens to it. It becomes like every other. It becomes religion. It's no longer transformative. And that's why God says, my message will move to the people whose hearts are hungry and desperate for it, right? But the problem is, is that when in, when in a culture like our culture now, where it has become religion, when, where it has become moralistic, where it has become, look at all the good things I've done, I've given that to God, and now let me in. And that's where God says, I never knew you. Because you couldn't stop your good deeds long enough to get to know me. And because of that, the church stops influencing the culture and it starts to resemble the culture. And so God moves the center to where people are desperate for this countercultural movement that transforms their lives. Because at the heart of Christianity is the cross. And the cross is all about giving up power. It's all about not holding on to anything. And it's about serving. Right? And so, what this also means is that God just doesn't give marching orders to, to some figurehead in some spot that speaks for the whole worldwide church because that's not how it does god is talking to and working through individual church communities to propel his gospel to everyone who lives right listen to what the text says some of them however men from cyprus and Cy cyrene went to antioch and began to speak to greeks also telling them the good news about the lord jesus the lord's hand was with them right no divine marching orders from jerusalem just a church that experienced experienced a movement of the holy spirit and then made the decision to begin to speak to the greeks themselves perhaps they had heard about peter <clears throat> talking to the gentile cornelius but they decided without the help of jerusalem to go on mission to antioch the Spirit of God moved because the center of the church was the cross. The center of the church was the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So how does that help us? How does that teach us about the role of discipleship in the church? Quite simply, if the church were only making converts... If the church was just about, okay, believe what I tell you to believe. If, if it was only about making converts, the church would never have moved outside of Jerusalem. It would have never survived, to be honest with you. It would have never survived Stephen's stoning and death if it was just about making converts. So what does it mean to be a disciple? And what does it mean to make a disciple? Right After all, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right. So the first point of the text is about discipleship is what is it? 
Discipleship is about imparting and helping followers of Jesus to know the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and then to apply the truth of the gospel to their lives so that their lives are transformed into the image of Jesus. Right? Discipleship is about helping people know the true message of the gospel and then helping people apply the gospel to every area of their lives. That's what discipleship is. It's about knowing the true gospel and it's about applying the true gospel to our lives. And that is a daily thing. Because I can promise you, friends, every single one of us here has areas of our lives that we have not applied the gospel to. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Discipleship is about teaching and learning the truth of the gospel so that the gospel bears fruit in the lives of Jesus' followers. Right? We know the areas of our lives that the gospel has been applied to because those areas of our life bear fruit. Fruit of the gospel. Not our own fruit, but the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Right? He's a follower of Jesus. He's received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then a little farther down, Paul says to him in verse 13, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Paul's saying, here's what you've learned. Now guard it and pass it on. Guard it means to protect the validity of it. Guard it means to protect the validity of the gospel, the true gospel, so that people don't fall under the spell of false teachers. Far too many false teachers out there and far too many Christian brothers and sisters falling prey to false teachers because they aren't being discipled and they're not discipling and they have not guarded the validity of the gospel in their lives. Paul taught Timothy that every action that emanates from a Christian life is a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to their heart. Right? And I think that this is, <clears throat> this is something that the church has a real hard time with. Understanding that discipleship is not learning to do more things, but it is about learning to apply the gospel to our lives so that the things that we do then build the kingdom. This is what the church has such a hard time with. At one point in Galatians 2, Paul is observing the way Peter has been acting with a group of Jewish Christians, and he observes that it is different than the way he has been acting around Gentile Christians. <clears throat> and instead of, of Paul going to uh, um, Peter and lambasting him, he says, Hey, Peter, your actions are inconsistent with the gospel doesn't say do things differently. <clears throat> he says, your conduct is not in step with the truth of the gospel. All right, this is far different than saying act differently. This is saying that the motivation of your heart is not in line with the gospel. Discipleship is learning the truth of, of the whole gospel and then learning to apply the whole gospel to every area of our lives. It's about applying the cross of Jesus Christ to our lives. Right? God seeks to transform our hearts, but we, he can't do it if we don't know the truth of the gospel. Discipleship reinforces the gospel in our lives. And that's what Barnabas and Paul were doing in Antioch. They were reinforcing the truth of the gospel into the life of that church. 
right? Which brings us to the next point, which is <clears throat> the point that sort of, when we talk about discipleship, everybody automatically says, okay, well, how do I do it? That's where we always go to, right? Instead of sort of understanding, we go, okay, yeah, 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 I get that. Okay, but how? What do I do? <laughs> right? But that's not what the text gives us. What it does give us is the foundational principle of all discipleship. There's an incredible foundational principle of discipleship that if we miss this, we can't do all of the other things, all of the other good things that we do and talk about in terms of discipleship. If we don't understand this, discipleship is investment. Look at verse 22 and then 25 and 6. <clears throat> now this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Then a little further down, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Right? News of what was going on in Antioch, it, it gets back to uh, Jerusalem. News that Gentiles in great numbers are coming to faith means that they needed to be supported by those who have been following Jesus longer and who were wiser. Right? Barnabas initially goes there to see if what was happening in Antioch was a true movement of the Spirit, was a genuine movement of the Spirit. And when he saw that it was, he did everything that he could to support that church, including going and getting Paul. He didn't just say, oh yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, God's there, good, and then went home. He invested himself. He invested himself into the life of the church. We need to understand something. Jesus invested his life into his disciples and taught them how to invest their lives into people, right? That, so that those people could go and invest their lives into other people. But Jesus also invested something else. He didn't just invest in his disciples. He invested in us as well. Okay, He invested in us, not by his life, although there, there is that. He gave us sample. But he invested in us by his death so that the Holy Spirit could invest his life in us. Jesus invested in each one of us by his death so that the Holy Spirit could invest his life in us. And if we don't have... The cross at the center of the church. The blood of Jesus Christ at the center of the church. We can't get this. We will never get this. Because it is only through Jesus' death that he invested in us. So that the Holy Spirit could invest his life in us. So that there would be power in the church. In Jesus' church. Jesus made the ultimate investment in us. He gave us his life so that we could have life. Discipleship in the kingdom of God then is not an optional extra that we can take or leave. It is how life is lived as a Christian. All of us should be, I, excuse me, all of us should be able to identify the people in our lives that are investing in us and who are, and who we are investing in. Right? There is no such thing, friends, as a mature Christian that doesn't need to be discipled. We all need to be discipled. And I'm not just talking about someone who we call every now and again. I'm talking about someone who keeps us accountable and who we are accountable to. Someone we are willing to listen to. Right? I'm talking about people that, that we meet with and meet with us regularly. Who we are open and honest with. Who encourage us when we need encouraging us. But also will tell us when to shape up when we need to, to shape up. Right? The sad part of this is that I'm willing to bet that many of us here do most of our Christian journey by, by ourselves. Because we're not in discipling relationships. And that leads us to some very, very dark and poor places. And it leads us to being susceptible to false teachers and a, and a gospel that is void of the cross.
What's interesting also is that the text says the followers, uh, the, 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 the followers, the original name for Jesus' followers were followers of the way, right? It's interesting here at Antioch for the first time, they are called Christians. And, and this was meant to be anything but a flattering term. This was meant to be a, a disparaging term when they called them Christians. But Peter, in, uh, uh, in 1 Peter 4.16, he says this. He says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Amazing, eh? Name that was given to Christians that was meant to be a disparaging name. Actually, we get to, that, that name is glorified because it magnifies Jesus. Which brings me to the final point, and I think the most important point today is the why we do discipleship. Why did Jesus say, go and make disciples of all the nations? Why didn't he just go and say, get people to believe the way, I, the way you believe? Why did he say, I want you to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why did he say, and know that I am with you to the very end of the age? I think it's because of what the text says in verse 24. When he arrived and saw that the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. We do discipleship so that when the grace of God comes into the lives of the precious children of God, they remain true to the Lord. They don't end up like the people that the writers of Hebrews 6 is talking about. Hebrews 6 says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him in contempt. For land that has come drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. What's saying is, is in, in very succinct terms, that anyone who says that they have tasted the grace of God and have tasted the goodness of his word and the beauty of his kingdom, but fail to understand the real and true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, will not bear in their lives the fruit of the gospel, but their life will bear the thorns of religion. And this is what we've been talking about. There is no salvation in religion. Right? These are the same people that will say to Jesus, well, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all kinds of ministry in your name? And to which Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Jesus says to us over and over again, you religious people, you fail to see the significance of who I am or what I'm doing or what I'm saying. You fail to understand that you have nothing of value to offer God and yet you are arrogant and self-righteous. This is the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that I talked about at the beginning. It's not that there is any sin that is unforgivable, but it's that we have become so caught up in our self-righteousness that we have become unrepentable. It's when we become so sure of ourselves that the blood disappears from the gospel and the cross disappears from our lives. Right? Sadly. Sadly, I have been listening to many dear brothers and sisters through social media and through other places, and not just one or two, but many, talk down about people and share how frustrated they are and disgusted they are and mad they are because people aren't following the rules the way they think they should be, or they support groups or parties that they don't think they should support. 
Talking down about anyone is a failure to understand the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, friends, Christians that understand the gospel and apply it to their lives know that they are nothing and have nothing to offer. But they have received all of the blessings in full from the kingdom of God. And they are already in their life. There's nothing to be earned. There's nothing to be earned. When we know that, that's what, a, that's what a real Christian is. Somebody who knows that they are worse than they ever dare dream, but knows that they are more loved than they could ever dare imagine. That's who a true Christian is. Such an, ad, such an understanding of that brings gratitude for everyone and love for those who think differently because the grace of God means we don't have the right to look down on anyone. Why do we disciple? So that we help prepare each other in Christ to live in the fullness of the kingdom of God now. Remaining true to the Lord with all of our hearts now so that the gospel flourishes in our church, communities, and revival happens now. Barnabas discipled the church in Antioch in order, to remain, in order that it remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Friends, that's why we disciple. <clears throat> so we all remain true to the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. Friends, as, as I, I was thinking about this the other day, <clears throat> and I was sitting in my study... And I was staring at that chart that I've been telling you about for weeks, the signs of revival. And this thought, it punched me right in the gut. It's a sad thing that we need to seek revival. Think about that for a minute. Think about the fact that it's sad that we need to seek revival. Remember what Lloyd-Jones said. Revival was. Revival above everything else is a glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is the restoration of him to the center of the life of the church. The fact that we have to seek revival means that we have to let, that we have let, excuse me, the fact that we have to seek revival means the, that we have let the flame go out. It means that the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't been at the center of the church in our lives, and we haven't been seeking with all our hearts to glorify him. That's why we seek revival. Because Jesus hasn't been at the center of our lives or at the center of our church. Derek asked us the other day what would happen if we were to gather to pray together every single evening. Well, what would happen is, is we would see revival because the Lord Jesus Christ would be restored to the center of our church. Right? The, but here's the thing. The good news is that God is the God of revival. There's nothing that he desires more than to revive the hearts of his children. There's nothing he desires more than to revive his church. Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, <clears throat> I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Friends, <clears throat> I know that this gets quoted a lot, and we always, we always claim this verse as a, as a personal verse, right? But the truth is that this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you, not to harm you. This is a promise for Jesus' church. It's not an individual promise. It is a promise to prosper the church. And not prosper in, in financial gains, but fraught, prosper in terms of, of, of Jesus being at the center. Prosper in terms of the impact that it has in the community. Prosper in terms of what God wants to do in the world. But Jesus has to be restored to the center. 
The church has to be about the cross. Individuals can't be about themselves. Religion has no place here. Jesus' church needs to know and it needs to embrace that it has nothing, nothing of value to offer anyone. We have nothing of value to offer God. We can't create a righteousness of our own and hand it to God and say, look what I've done. If we do that, if we attempt to do that, <clears throat> if we pretend to do that, God will say, I never knew you. We have nothing of value to offer God. But he has given us the keys to his kingdom. And only when the cross is at the center of the church will we then be able to unlock the door. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God and <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, Lord, for what you're doing, what you're reminding us of, that the cross must be at the center of our lives, that, that we disciple oh, so that we stay firmly planted and grounded in the true gospel, that we don't become a bunch of Pharisees who are always about what they do. We... Lord, desire to be about who you are. So thank you, Jesus, for your love and your mercy, but mostly your grace. God, thank you for your grace. If it wasn't for your grace, we would have died in our sin long ago. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray, Father, that none of us would be seeing or thinking of ourselves above anybody else. I pray that you would humble us, God, and that we would seek you, that we would desire to be a part of your church here, committed to what you're doing here. Pray, Father, as the psalmist prayed, show us the path where we should walk. Guide us in your truth and teach us for you and you alone, our God, our Savior. And our hope is in you all day long. In the name of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.